hear when you call. And we ask that as your word is read, we would hear it as a summons to come before you, to acknowledge you, to have respect for your voice, to uh, lend not only our, our, our ears, but to give our hearts and minds to you for instruction, for comfort, for guidance, for, for rebuke or correction, Lord, for whatever it is that we need most. And Father, we pray that to those ends you would bless this reading and the preaching of your word. We pray that we might know something of our Savior and our salvation, maybe be reminded of something we've known for a long time, but Lord, nonetheless, to be moved to be enlightened, to be changed, to be empowered, to live for you this week. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Job chapter 39, beginning with verse 19, the Word of God. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His, majest his majestic snorting is terrifying. He paws in the valley and exults in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver, the flashing spear, and the javelin. With fierceness and rage he swallows the ground. He cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the rock he dwells and makes his home. On the rocky crag and stronghold, from there he spies out the prey. His eyes behold it from far away. His young ones suck up blood, and where the slain are, there he is. This ends the reading of God's Word. Well, with these two snapshots, one of a horse and one of a hawk or eagle, we have a conclusion of this kind of menagerie or zoo of animals that God presents to Job for Job's consideration. And as we look at what God is intending when he presents Job with this picture of a horse and this picture of a hawk, let's remind ourselves of what God is doing in this passage of Scripture, beginning with chapter 38, verse 1. You see, Job has been complaining against God. He has said God has withheld from him what is right. He says God has not acted with him justly. Job has said, I have done nothing to deserve the suffering that I have, therefore I ought not to suffer, and God is withholding from me the life that I deserve, or I should have. Now, to boil it down, that's in a nutshell what Job's complaint is. Now, Job is not at any point uh, suggesting that he doesn't believe God or follow God or love God. And it is a feature of Scripture that we see all too often that men like Moses and men like Habakkuk himself complain against God, even in a conversation with God that can only be had through a very great measure of faith. So it's important to remember that Christians sometimes complain against God. That's very important to remember. But it's also very important to remember, it's never right to complain against God. What does the Apostle Paul say in Philippians chapter 3? Does he say, I have attained perfection and I have been made complete? No, he says the opposite. I have not. In point of fact, he says, all of my righteous acts up to this point I consider to be skubala. That's a Greek word. It's a word that should be translated S-H-I-T. And I know I can sometimes be offensive for such biblical vulgarities in the pulpit. But how often do we think of our own righteousness that way? Wouldn't we be far more humble to a man and woman? A little bit more broken and contrite? A little bit more gracious? You see, Job is like us, despite being the most godly man who ever lived. He had that streak of complaining in him. And he is so bold and presumptuous that at one point Job, this mighty godly man, this father in the faith, he says, I will meet with God 
but I will ask him questions and he will answer me. And that is precisely what God says is not going to happen. When God finally speaks to Job out of the whirlwind, He says, No, Job. Gird yourself up like a man. Prepare yourself for battle. Because I'm going to ask questions of you. And you are going to answer me. And the questions that God asks Job, <coughs> dozens of them, none of them deal with Job directly. In fact, none of them deal with people directly. He begins by asking Job a series of questions about the architecture or the context of Job's life. Job, do you know how I made the world? Like a master builder? Laying foundations, building exactly the plan beautifully that the angels celebrated? Do you know how I ordained for the weather cycle? Do you know, Job, do you know how to, uh, to steward the hail and the snow and the rain? Do you know how to hold the oceans at bay? Do you know how to uh, do these things? You, Job, the idea being, Job, you don't understand and you cannot control even the setting of your life. How are you in a position to make judgments upon or understand the greater moral picture of my sovereignty? You're not, Job. And then he goes on and he says, now, Job, we've addressed the context, the, the form, if you will. Now let's look at the substance of the living creatures in this world. Are you willing and able to take care of creatures like the raven and the lion? One very dangerous, one very despised? Would you even do that? I do that. Are you able to take care of and tend creatures that have no blessing or no benefit whatsoever to settle humanity? The wild goat, the wild donkey, and the wild bull. And then he looks at the most ridiculous, mocked, most uh, generally considered stupid creature. We have a phrase, that guy's as dumb as a box of hammers. Have you ever heard that? There was an ancient Near Eastern saying, as dumb or as stupid as an ostrich. And God speaks at length about the ostrich and how God called that and ordained that despite its very real and its alleged deficiencies. It is a joyful creature that lives its life as God ordained. And then he talks about the horse and he talks about the hawk or the eagle. Now, the horse first. The thing about the horse here is that the horse is in one sense the only domesticated animal that God bothers to reference. When God goes over all the animals here in Job chapter 39, all of them are wild and far removed from the, the benefit or the affection of, of humans. But out of all of the animals that were domesticated, the horse is the wildest one, so say the commentators and, and Bible scholars. I don't think that the idea in Job chapter 39 is that God is looking at particularly wild or dangerous animals. I don't think that's the point. The common denominator between all of these animals that God picks is that they all have been created by and called by God to live their lives in hostile environments. All of them. The lion. The raven. The donkey, the goat, the bull. They all live in the wilderness, in the desert, in places that we would never choose to live. Now what does that have to do with the horse? I have been called out publicly on a couple of occasions in the last month for having a very, very sick addiction, and you might need to go to Presbytery with this later. I love Hallmark movies. <laughs> and I will not turn in my man card. I, I grew up hunting and fishing, and I rebuilt carburetors, so I get to hold on to my man card, but I love Hallmark movies. And horses in Hallmark movies, they're, they're so docile. They're so sweet. You'd have them at your dinner table, right? They're so nice. And our vision of horses in the world today is that they're sort of calming. They're pastoral. They're, they're just nice, Right? No? Hey, someone knows better. <laughs> the horse in the ancient Near East was not used for riding. Donkeys were used for riding. 
The horse was not used for agricultural purposes. It never pulled a plow in the ancient Near East or in Egypt. That was the job of the ox. The horse was singularly used in ancient Near Eastern cultures from Babylon to Egypt to Greece as an instrument of war. That's what it was used for. It was used for what we would today class mounted infantry. You know, the stirrup hadn't been invented and wouldn't be invented for centuries to come after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So when you hear references to uh, Solomon's stables, those horses were not used for people to ride on with spears and lances. They didn't even have, Israel didn't even have mounted bowmen. That took a lifetime of training without stirrups. They used them to pull chariots. Or they used them for kings to ride upon or for soldiers to get from point A to point B and then they dismount and go fight on foot. But the horse was trained for battle. That's what the horse was. It was a creature that was military. And this picture of the horse is a picture that is mighty. And it's an unusual word for mighty. That's why it's not merely strength. Did you give the horse his strength? This translated, did, did you give him his might? Did you clothe his neck with a mane? Some of the older translations put with thunder because of the waving, uh, shaking effect of it. But it's also a word used for mane, and the mane was associated with the horse and the lion. It wasn't generally referred to with a donkey, even though arguably it has one too. <laughs> You leap like a locust. You, you have the ability, the power, the strength to do this. This majestic snorting, you know, pawing the valley. That's literally the translation, but we understand that to be like when a horse stamps the ground in expectation of, uh, of charging at someone, going out to meet weapons. And there's descriptions of the weapons, by the way. The quiver, the bow and arrow, the spear, the javelin were all weapons used from the back of a chariot. So here is a horse that is majestic, it is powerful, it is strong, it is courageous, it has, for lack of a better word, fortitude. Its might consists in the fact that it is utterly undaunted by the fact that its whole purpose in life is lived in a context of blood, sweat, and tears. It is designed for the hour in which it lives, and it lives in that hour. That is in the ancient Near Eastern imagination with that little model of a, that brayer model of a horse up on your bookshelf when you're a child was in the ancient world. It was an animal that God had created that had a purpose and lived that purpose well even when that purpose was an utterly hostile environment. I want you to think about how that might have been a challenge or an encouragement to Job. I hope that none of us in this room actually love conflict. Because to me, that's almost a borderline psychopath. We, don't, we shouldn't love conflict. We should love peace. How pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity, the Psalms teach us. Peace is what Jesus leaves his disciples. It is peace that we pray for. But there are seasons in all of our life where there is conflict. For Job, there was conflict. He was conflicted within himself, such that he despaired of life. He was conflicted with his friends. His friends, he calls them miserable comforters. And he argues with them. Nobody mentally and emotionally healthy, loves an argument where names are being bandied about and godly men act, well, not like godly men. Nobody enjoys that. Nobody enjoys having uh, in their hour of sickness their spouse thinking their breath is bad and shunning them. No one uh, uh, enjoys having children uh, call him names or taunt him. These are all things Job experienced. And in a sense... When you look at how all of these little vignettes or snapshots or postcards of a, a scene of creation or a scene of an animal in creation would present with Job an example of how God and His goodness and His sovereignty has created in certain contexts, certain creatures, certain natural phenomena to take place 
within which his congregation is able to be and do that which his creation is called to be and do. And here the horse is able to rise up, even in the most difficult of situations, and say, aha, one of the rare instances of an animal being personified in the scriptures. Perhaps an onomatopoeia sounding like a horse neighing or whinnying in excitement at the thought that now I get to be in this moment what God has called me to be at this moment. And Job, in the midst of his troubles, could have perhaps sat back and considered that horse and thought, God has put me here, He's put me now for a reason. And I can do this. I can survive this day. It's not going to kill me. And, you know, if it does kill me, I'm just going to be with the Lord. <laughs> but too often, when we experience difficult times, you are tempted to do exactly what I want to do. Psalm 11, flee to the mountains and hide. Too often, we don't want to live and be who God has called us to be in that moment of conflict. We don't want to be in that place of strife. And so we fail. We complain. We argue. We get petty. And we lack the moral reserve or the spine to be God's woman, to be God's man in that day of battle. And instead, we become free agents. We become like the people of God in the days of the judges and do whatever is right in our eyes. Or we become like Job and we completely collapse within ourselves and wish we had never been born. You see, Job had every opportunity to exercise the same kind of strength, the same kind of fortitude in his difficulty that the horse did. And in a sense, God is saying to Job, Job, you are lacking in those character traits that if you just open your eyes and look around you, you would see them in the lion and the raven, in the mountain goat, the wild ass. You'd see them in the undomesticated bull. You'd see them. You'd see that the ostrich, for all its stupidity, is doing a better job than you are right now, Job. You would see that even a horse seems to be doing better than you right now. You'll remember that the Psalms tell us that we should not be like the horse or the mule that needs a bit or a bridle. But we should instead be humble before the Lord. And Job begins to understand all of this. We'll see his response in Job chapter 40 because Job responds twice to the Lord, once in chapter 40 and once in chapter 42. But the horse shows us, dear Christian, that even in the suffering that comes with times of conflict, you can continue to be a godly person. And you do not have to fall into the ways of the world, the complaining, the arguing, that Job fell into. But what about the hawk? God doesn't ask the, uh, Job about the fortitude of the hawk. He asks him about uh, the hawk's very peculiar ability to soar. That's an intensive verb for flying very, very high and spread his wings towards the south. Probably a reference to migration. And a lot of the... Uh, Bible scholars that really dig into the different features of animals in the text of the Old Testament in particular say this is probably a reference to the kestrel. The kestrel is a, a kind of hawk, evidently, and I'm not a bird guy, so you can check this out on your own, your own time. But the kestrel is a bird that's very, very common throughout that entire area that is a migratory falcon or hawk. And these words, eagle and hawk, that are used in the text of uh, Job here are words that are more like how we would use the word hawk. I could say that's a hawk, and that could mean any number of different hawks. Or I could say that's an eagle, and that would mean any different kind of eagle. This, the words for hawk and eagle used here are indefinite words, much like our, our word raptor. 
If I say that's a raptor, that means, in my mind anyway, and I'm by no stretch of the imagination an ornithologist, a bird expert, when I think raptor, I just think of a big scary bird that eats other living creatures and that aren't worms, invertebrates, other birds, things of that nature. But these are big birds that migrate and that nest in mountains. These are the features of this bird. And Job is being asked by God, is it by your understanding that these birds can do these things? That they can be nomadic and travel about the world? Is it by your command that they go up and nest on high? This reference to the mountains is what connects this animal to the others. Because again, all of these animals have in common the fact that none of them live where any person would want to. Now, uh, we like the mountains, don't we? I know uh, Steve and Becky, they like to get away to the mountains. And uh, I've had some Zoom meetings with him because he's up at a cabin in the mountains. And that's awesome. But if you read your Old Testaments, the mountains were not a place of retreat in a sense of going away to rest. The mountains were a place to which you fled when everywhere else was just too dangerous. And we find that in this psalm that I referred to earlier, Psalm 11. Psalm 11 shows us a fascinating inner dialogue of David. Psalm chapter 11, verse 1. It opens this way. <clears throat> in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? And this is an idea that comes up throughout the scriptures, that the mountains are the abodes of the birds. It's the place where you go to hide. It's not the place where you go to vacation. It's not where you go to live. It's not where you build your house. It's far from reliable, uh, non-seasonal water sources. It's uh, far from the agrarian breadbaskets of society. The roads aren't that great. It would be like deliberately going to live someplace where you didn't have any kind of supermarket nearby and zero cell service. That's not where you want to go. This is where you go to get off the grid and to escape. When the Philistines, when the Moabites, when the Midianites come through, you go to the mountains. But he lives on the mountains. It's a place of fortresses and redoubts and hideaways. It's where you go when it's dangerous. You don't go there by choice. It's where Elijah goes to hide. It's where Moses goes to get away. It's where Jesus goes when he's looking for solace, when his disciples are on the boat in the Sea of Galilee. And here's a picture of a bird who, okay, not only is it by God's design nomadic going through different periods of life seasonally, but it is also a bird that lives where no person could conceivably live. And yet God has given it what it needs, keen eyesight, to be able to spot its food from afar and to stoop down out of the sky and grab that rabbit and feed its young. And this section of God's speech ends <coughs> with this proverb, where the slain are, there he is. Jesus uses a version of this when he says, where the body is, there is the vulture as well. You know, God has given this hawk everything it needs to live a life that is unstable and remote. He has equipped it with what is necessary for it to find food, to reproduce, to carry on generation to generation. And it's God's understanding. Think about the magnitude of the insights of God into creation. That he can balance all of these things. All of them. Do you, how many of you know of the old computer game? It, it's first, it, its first copy came out in the very late 80s on one of those floppy disks that was 3.5 by 3.5 called, it was called Sim City. Has anybody heard of that? And for a while there, it was used in public schools and private schools alike to, to teach young people things about urban planning and budgeting and all sorts of things. And something about that game, so I grew up playing that game, it is almost impossible to create, using the algorithms that they thought were most accurate, a thriving society or city without constantly borrowing money from the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Balancing everything is very hard to do. Think about how many times we as people today 
and our desire to protect the environment because the environment needs people like us to protect it, people like us who can, can barely balance our own personal budgets. We're going to balance nature, right? So we go in to try to ecologically fix things. How often do we make it even worse? The zebra mussel in the St. Lawrence River. Okay, there's a complete unmitigated disaster. The Asian carp in the Missouri and the Mississippi. The list goes on and on and on where when we try to fine-tune the world around us, it takes God to fine-tune and balance creation. And what God has shown Job over and over and over again in his snapshots or postcards about creation and about creatures is that, God, I've got this. I am the God who is able to care for and sustain and provide for all of these creatures and all of these situations you would never want to be in. And they thrive. Four of them are described as laughing or rejoicing. They carry on generationally. They have what they need despite the fact that they live in barren wildernesses. They have no benefit from humans. They are useless. They are despised. They are considered stupid or unclean. They live in places you would never choose to live. And yet they thrive. And we as people, we find that we're in a situation we would not choose. Right? We would not choose to be in a situation where we see that in two years we might run out of money. We, we would never choose to live in a situation where we have an eye disease or whatever you have, and you have something, believe me, you might not know it, but it's in there. Your DNA is ticking away. you got something, and it's not good. <laughs> think about all the things about your life that you think, well, if I didn't have this, I could be happier. Like the ostrich, if my wings were those of a stork, then I'd flap them. Or if only this, then. God is saying, Job, you're sitting here bemoaning your life and you are begrudging me my providential care and plan for you when you don't even begin to grasp my plan. You don't even have the ability to understand the world around you. You can see and touch and feel. And all these other creatures, they, by God's design, have a simple confidence that the Lord will feed them and they will live and they live their lives joyfully frolicking as the whale does on the waves, or flapping wings like the ostrich in the desert. And what a humbling lesson for Job. That no matter what the circumstance or context of his life is, he needs to be focused on being and doing what God has called him to be and do. Just like the ostrich did, just like the horse does, just like the hawk does, just like the goat and the donkey and the bull and the lion and the raven. I want you to think, dear Christian, about those things in your life that you find inadequate or undesirable or that you wish were different. Maybe there are things about your biography. Maybe there's things in the past that are mountains for you that you just can't shake. Maybe there are deep regrets Maybe there are things that you've done or things that have been done to you. Maybe there are things that concern the contours of your life in terms of your health or your wealth or your, uh, your relationships or your number of followers on Instagram. We are a weird species so concerned about so many things that really need not concern us. I want to invite you to think back over all these messages on the creatures and the creation that God gives Job. And allow God's Word to humble you and simply recognize that God has put you right here, right now, so that His glory and grace might shine through you and be a blessing to others. He has blessed you that you might be a blessing. And from your mountaintop, from your desert, from your swampy, greedy stream bank with the bowl, from your unclean pit that the raven likes, from wherever it is that you are in the worst terms you can imagine, bless somebody. Run with abandon. Fly high. 
stamp the ground and flare your nostrils like a horse and live. Live. Don't let yourself get sucked into the foolish condition of Job where all he seems to be able to fixate on is how it is not ideal or it's disastrous or things aren't going well or can't go well or won't go well. Live your life. That is a positive and beautiful word, dear Christian. Live. Laugh like the ostrich. Be courageous like the horse. Be mobile, farsighted and brave and clever like the eagle. But live. I can't tell you how much I hope some of my lacrosse guys are going to be here today. This past week, after one of them came and heard the sermon on the ostrich, all I heard about on the practice field was the ostrich. <laughs> that sermon almost went viral in my own little uh, congregation of lacrosse athletes. Did we practice like ostriches today, coach? A couple of you did. Uh, and I was hoping they would come because one of my great desires is to see people live. And the only way you can live what I would tell them if they were here today, and I will tell them tomorrow when I see them. The only way to really live is to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't follow your checkbook. Don't follow your Facebook account. Don't follow the Times newspaper. <clears throat> Don't follow other people. Don't follow sports. Don't follow the arts. Follow Jesus. And do what you can to point other people in this wilderness, mountaintop, bizarre desert experience of living on this side of heaven in a creation that groans for renewal. Do what you can to bring someone with you before the throne of grace. Almighty God, we thank You and we praise You that we're able to look at creation and see such beauty and to see such awesome intelligence at work. How we can marvel. And scientists yet are stunned at the ability of creatures from butterflies to kestrels to migrate, to make their living in places that are so hostile. There are cellular forms of life that live even in the volcanic eruptions under, under the ocean. Lord, it's, it's mind-boggling how life is possible. And Lord, our life is possible. We can truly live in any circumstance, even in a circumstance where we are bereft of our family, where we have lost all of our money, where we are filled with disease, where our friends scorn us, where our wife despises us. We can live. Father, help us to live as we carry our crosses and help us to assist one another in carrying burdens. And we might be a visible and a powerful image of how it is that Jesus Christ came to carry our burdens. And Father, I ask that you bless everyone in this congregation. We're a small group today, but Lord, I pray that you would help us to have the courage and the faith to live lives in positive, beautiful, gracious, sweet, compelling ways, despite the fact that in every one of our lives so many things have gone sideways. We're so deeply marked by sin. Yet, by grace, we can laugh, we can fly, we can run, we can worship. Help us to do that, O living God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.